Welcome back to The Breakfast and Plus TV Africa. Time for us to check out the front pages of our national dailies. Uh, we have Okona Bonkotaria who joins us to analyze uh, some of the big stories on the dailies. I start off with the daily independent newspaper this morning and the bold caption reads, Households food security under threat in Nigeria. The World Bank is quoted on that. Senator raises the alarm over threats to Nigeria's sovereignty. And you find... Senate passes real estate regulatory bill to curb fraudulent practices. Another caption says, four people die in another building collapse in Lagos. Uh, it's, I don't know. I mean, that's quite interesting if you ask me. Why federal government secured $72 million from World Bank for 36 states? The minister is quoted on that. And the FAAC shares... 671.910 billion naira to federal government, states, local governments for October. And another uh, header says, APC seals off streets leading to Secretariat over security report. Oshun Guba poll, PDP to commence sale of forms November 22nd. And the Federal Executive Council okays 27.4 billion naira contract award for works, housing, FCT ministries, all of that you find uh, on the Daily Independent. And just before we move away, North's rulership, a disaster for Nigeria, says Bokno uh, Kirile, uh, asks government to compensate families of victims killed at Lekki Toll Gate. That's the much we can take on the Daily Independent newspaper this morning. And now to the Punch newspapers. Nigeria risks U.S. arms embargo over alleged protesters' killings by soldiers. AI director asked U.S. Congress to apply Leahy laws against Nigeria. And government officials risk visa ban, withdrawal of privileges, says Akin Teriwa. PDP reps ask uh, Blinken to probe violence against NSAR's protests. Or protesters, I beg your pardon. Also on the punch this morning, eight killed and vehicles burnt as a speeding tanker and truck collide in Ogun. Um, we can also find here PDP knocks Akere Dolu as gov governor appoints son DG nominates 21 others. Federal government demands probe of uh, Ivorian cop over jailed Nigerians' death. Four construction workers die as two buildings collapse in Lagos. And we can uh, find here this uh, morning on the punch still Ishaku Ishaku's aide laments as Cameroonian separatists kill 11 in Taraba. And 348 travelers killed in 771 road crashes in Ondo, Gombe, and Kwaibom, says the FRSC. Fulfill agreement with ASU. Save varsities from fresh closure, Sultan tells Buhari. Passengers lament as railway workers begin strike ground services. And federal government raises uh, power tariff December begins free meter purchase. And also inflation may push 91 million Nigerians below poverty line, says the World Bank. All right, let's move away from the punch and check out the Guardian newspaper this morning. And you have an editorial saying federalism is the answer after all. All of that on the Guardian newspaper this morning. The bold caption reads uncertainties as tenure of uh, Nigerian Regulatory uh, Commission, uh, Nigerian Electricity Regulatory Commission uh, Commissioner ends. That's what you find as a bold caption this morning. APC crisis festers as please condone off Secretariat again. NAS cannot provide constitution to take us to the promised land. Fan who's saying all of that when you check out the Guardian this morning. And you also have 11 killed, others missing as Cameroonians attack Taraba. Four killed, five rescued in another collapse building in Lagos. That's the much we can take this morning on the Guardian newspaper. And on the nation, disquiet as petrol sells for 159 naira per litre at depot. A product raised, uh, raised by 11 naira per litre. NMPC accuses operators of breaching pact. U.S. removes Nigeria from religious freedom violators list. Um, it says uh, notably missing from the list is Nigeria, a country that the State Department had named as a CPC in previous years. And SARS, leaked report has errors, says panel member. 
Lagos uh, 6 restraint. Uh, we can also find here one killed and 68 abducted in Niger State. Senate probes Lagos gas explosion. IG, female cops can live with uh, civilian spouses in barracks. There was a little bit of controversy yesterday after a uh, you know, contrary story um, um, was uh, put out, you know, saying that female uh, Nigerian policewomen, who of course didn't marry um, from the force, were being kicked out of the barracks. Also this morning, NNPC gets 104 billion naira loan from Afri Exim Bank, and Cameroonian separatists kill 11 in Taraba community. There's so much. Good morning, Mr. Upunabo Inkotaria. Thanks for joining us once again. Good morning. All right. Thank you. Good morning. Yeah, we probably should start from the um, um, uh, Taraba State story. It says the Amazonian uh, warriors, or what, I'm not sure what they are called now, um, of course, attacked Taraba and killed about 11 people in Taraba. Um, and of course, that's one of the stories that was uh, stated on the Daily Independent about fears about Nigeria's sovereignty. I think it was um, on the Daily Independent this morning. Yes, it says, Senator raises alarm over a threat to Nigeria's sovereignty after the Amazonian attack. Uh, so let's, let's start with that, Ms. Ankutaria. Um, how much of a problem do you think we have? Well, it is um, so sad that because uh, it awakens reminiscent of what happened in the Second Republic when on that uh, the late President Shou Shagari, when I think it was Mali invaded Nigeria, then the present uh, president, the president Muhammad Buhari, I think was a geocious at that time. And he repelled the attack even without getting any premature from President Buhari I saw the President Chagari. He never did. And when he was queried, he said that it was part of the constitutional responsibility of the military to protect the territorial integrity of the nation. So he went ahead without uh, getting an instruction to go ahead from the CNC. It is sad that now he is the CNC and he is unable to contain this invasion. Because even the Boko Haram, he himself said it on several occasions, that these were non-Nigerians invading the country. And they only assert the issue of sovereignty of a nation when it has to do with uh, internal crisis. If IPOB should today get up and protest, or uh, the uh, Arewa, or any of these groups, even the Niger Delta militants, they will say they will not sit back and watch Nigerians threaten the sovereignty of a nation. Now we have external people, external aggressors, coming to threaten the sovereignty of the nation with impunity, because in most cases they do these things, succeed and go back. Or they conquer those territories like local governments, like we had in Bono State and some other states in the north. We had the Boko Haram and these bandits are already in charge. They, they, they hold sway in those, in those local governments. Even the governments confirmed this one. So it is so sad that we have a president or we have a governor. Most times when we say president, a lot of people. Uh, we've slanted the interpretation into it by you keep attacking the president, you keep attacking the president, but the box of at his table. So whether if today we have a government that is a government that is acceptable, a government that is plausible, then everybody will still commend Mr. President. If we have the economy that is thriving, that is booming, a lot of people will commend the president. So if the reverse is the case, if, if anything to the contrary happens, he also takes the day. So when we say Mr. President, Mr. President, what is it like how like mechanical? Yes, that's that's the word for it. That symbolizes the government, it symbolizes the nation as we speak right now. So it is sad that Mr. President is failing in his duty to protect Nigeria because when these invasions take place, they invade and they wreak havoc, they kill, they maim, they destroy. And the uh, major responsibility of the government is to protect lives and property. So the government is repudiating its obligation. And that is why it is becoming worrisome. Because we have a concatenation of these attacks. It is not just a one-off thing. Today, is you're going to hear of Bono. Tomorrow, you're going to hear of Niger State. Maybe the day after, you're going to hear of another state. So the country is almost under siege. Almost under siege. And this is a government that maximizes the minimum and minimizes the maximum. You have 
uh, uh, external aggressors coming to destroy and invade your nation. You are less concerned about that. You are more concerned about people who are protesting against your bad government, who are protesting against your maladministration. I think uh, the president should be alive to his responsibility. I have conviction that uh, the president actually really has nothing to offer anymore. The military returns have set it. And that is why the nation is facing the kind of problems it is facing, both internally and externally. All right, let's check out the Daily Independent newspaper this morning. Uh, World Bank is saying that the effect of COVID-19 pandemic have brought Nigerian household food security under threat. Do you agree with this postulation? COVID-19? No, I don't think it's more of COVID-19. It's more of security, the security situation, the parallel situation in which we find ourselves. Yes, I agree. When we had the lockdown, of course, when people sat back, people were restrained from going out, and so businesses actually suffered. It had a domino effect on not just the business, on every aspect of life, every aspect of life, including relationships. The only people that were happy with the COVID-19 uh, restrictions were the wives, because they saw their husbands at home. The husbands and the kids, who spent, who spent more time. You couldn't tell your wife you're going to play golf. You couldn't tell her you had one meeting or the other. You couldn't talk about political meetings and so on, although there were breaches by uh, top top uh, politicians in the country who felt they were above the law. But uh, apart from that, I don't think it's more of COVID-19. Yeah, I don't think it's COVID-19 per se. I think it's more of the security situation in the country. I think that is what is actually... Because take, for example, Niger State. Niger State as a whole... The Niger State is almost twice the size of Eastern Nigeria. And my Niger State, the, the, uh, uh, the Niger State is known for agriculture and agriculture subsistence farming. And a lot of them could not go out to farm. And this affected grossly the uh, food uh, supply in the country. So I think while, yes, COVID-19, no doubt about that because of the restrictions, but I think it's more because if you talk of COVID-19, those uh, restrictions have been relaxed. So why do we still have an uh, 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 increase in food, uh, food prices? Why? How, do, how are you going to explain that? So it's not all about COVID-19. I think it has to do with the security situation in the country. Okay. Um, so you know, the, the United Nations is actually talking of globally. They are talking of globally. Uh, but Nigeria's case is an exception. <laughs> Nigerian case has nothing to do with the global effect of COVID-19. It has to do with the internal security challenges we are having. All right. Um, yeah, I think it, it, the World Bank is also talking about inflation, saying it, inflation um, may push 91 million Nigerians below poverty line. You know, so it's um, it's beyond, you know, no, like you said, it's is, beyond COVID-19. That is a, that's what I'm saying. That's a that, that's a refragable. Of course, when you talk of inflation, and when you talk of inflation, of course, in Nigeria, how I mean, it's per day, per day, and how much you earn. This has really nothing to do with uh, global economy. It really has to do with bad governance. Okay, for example, we keep borrowing, and how do you borrow to spend on recurrent expenditure? It is ridiculous. If you have to borrow, it should be on capital expenditure. But in this country, we borrow for Mr. President to travel out of the country. We borrow for Mr. President to go uh, on, on uh, uh, health vacation. We borrow to we borrow for air. Practically, I think it is possible to even borrow the air we breathe. We borrow the air we breathe. We borrow for everything, and that is what is important. Not minding the consequences of such borrowing, we don't mind it. We are not bothered. All we're interested in is what will get into our pocket immediately. Look at the. Um, uh, money is recovered, and the um, mess that Salami, who is supposed to be the attorney general, got, got a mess in. When you take all these issues on that background, you realize that the Nigerian problem really has to do with sincerity of focus. When you have characters who are in government who believe that once they are appointed, it's seen as a gravy trade. They are not there in the image of Nigeria. They are there to further align their pockets. Definitely, you are going to have all these issues. Uh, look at Asu going on striking to go on strike again. Now we borrow to do all kinds of things, but we neglect the necessary things, things that will ensure the continuous growth of this country, 
now and in the future because these are people once they go on strike students are going to suffer a lot of things are going to put on hold for every time if I should go on strike for one year I can tell you it has taken us back 10 years that is what a lot of people don't understand you know and you look at somebody a father is going to train first is expensive there is poverty is palpable and pervasive a man struggles he has the calculation, my child is going to be in school for four years. That child ends up being in school for six years, for seven years, for eight years. Not because the child failed, but because Asu went on strike. Because the federal government failed to do what it ought to do. So when you put all these issues together, why, why are you not going to have inflation? Why are you not going to have inflation? So much is being stolen from the system. Rather than people bringing in, they are stealing from the system. And every cobble you steal from the economy has an effect, one way or the other. And look at the way the, uh, the, government, the go government is doing wrong. What are government officials doing with 20 cars in their convoy, in their entourage? What are you going to do with that? Go to Ghana, you can never see that. Even if you go to Britain, they don't even have that. Most times it walks down to 10 down the street. Of course, you have the security checks everywhere. But most times it walks down to 10 down the street. So when you cut down on all these excesses to a very large extent, you are going to reduce inflation. But no, we will borrow for this and we pay because it is a loan. So you have to pay back. All right. Mr. Inkotaria, um, some of the things, of course, that has made headlines um, is the United States and the UN's reaction to the NSAS um, report. Um, it says on the Punch this morning, Nigeria risk U.S. arms embargo over alleged protesters' killings by soldiers. AI Director, Amnesty International Director, asks U.S. Congress to apply Leahy laws against Nigeria. Goes on to say, government officials risk visa ban, withdrawal of privileges, says Akin Terenwa. And PDP Rep acts blinking to probe violence against NSAS protesters. Um... Mr. Enkotara, do you think any of this is, is likely, seeing the United States' relationship with the, the current Nigerian government? And also, the, you know, how much interest the West really has in some of all these things? Well, the West is just playing the big brother role, so to speak. Uh, what is going to actually implement most of these uh, threats? It's, it's a different thing altogether, you know. Uh, it's all about interest. The West will not do what it will not cut its nose to spike its face. That's the truth about it. At some point, there will be a roundtable discussion on how to address this issue. I don't see the West coming down heavily on the Nigerian government, like it did in the days of Apache. I don't see that happening. But they are trying to mount pressure so that the federal government will ensure that uh, the victims of that... Uh, and such protests have been, uh, don't just die in vain, didn't just die in vain. I think that's what the federal government is trying to do. But let me commend the Lagos State panel for the, the ramrod integrity with which they sat through and having the gumption to come up with such uh, recommendations, findings and recommendations. I commend the government on the panels, honestly. I, I was one of those who impugned the sincerity. I thought it was going to be another pack jury. And I never, I never had any interest. But I was really pleased when the panel came up with this report. Although they are saying not everything is in that report is true, or the leaked document is true, but a lot of us are happy with it. So, what the federal government should do? You don't need any prompting. You don't need anybody to come and tell you what to do or what not to do, or to coerce you, or to riddle you, or talk you to do what you ought to do. What the federal government should do, or what the Lagos State government should do is to ensure that it implements the recommendations. The white paper, I want to believe, is not a review of the implementation of, of the recommendation, but I believe the white paper should be a review of the implementation process. That is what the white paper should be. Otherwise, anything short of that, I can tell you might stay another crisis in this country. The only way you can assuage the feelings of the tribulating families of those who, the families of those that lost uh, their loved ones is, by, because you can't bring back the dead, it's not possible, is by doing something to show penitence. And one way is to ensure that the commander, 
the man who commanded those military men to go and carry out that massacre is retired for it. It's retired for it. You are not going to blame those that open fire. Of course, they were they, they lack conscience. Without the twinge of conscience, they did what they did. But they took orders. And you all know that in the military, you must carry out the last order. You don't have a choice. Because once you do that, you can even be sacked. And dealt with and sacked from the force. You can be dismissed. So you don't blame those that went out to shoot. You blame the commanders. And even the Lagos state governor who invited the military should also be extricated from the blame. And one way he's going to show uh, penance is by ensuring that he carries out to the letter the recommendations of the panel. Mr. President is equally guilty because he is the commander-in-chief. The governor has no right to invite the military. So if the governor invited the military and obeyed by extension, it means that Mr. President was the one who gave the go-ahead. The box stops at his table. So something has to be done to assuage this feeling. And that is not only that, to also address the root causes of the crisis, the protest. Something has to be done. Okay. And I think all these things are embodied in that recommendation it's by the panel. Okay. The CBS queried, he did not query the content. What he did was to query the procedure, procedural observation, the way it was passed, the way it was leaked, but not the content. He didn't query the content. He said he's waiting for the state government to release the white paper. Yeah, before so, it's going so to that's what I want to get into. So, uh, Mr. Inkotara, hold on. Kindly hold on. So, so what do you think would be in the white paper? Because from what we've seen, it, there's a lot of, you know, there's a level of indictment that the state governor has. And so when they've presented the report to him, and he's meant to now be presenting a, a white paper concerning it, what might be different between these two documents? Talking of the white paper, I mean, uh, it's, it's normal. I mean, when, when panels recommend, maybe they submit their findings and make recommendations, definitely you need a white paper and gazette. So it's a normal thing. What, we are, what, what Nigerians are bothered about is that they should not think that. They should not at all in any way. Because most times what the government will do is they will go and expunge all those things that indicted them, all those uh, indictments in the white paper. They will try to expunge them or try to embellish them. And that is why I believe the, the panel, let me not say the panel because I'm not sure that, that's why I believe it was somehow leaked. So that the, the government will be aware that Nigeria, the government will know that Nigerians are aware of the content of the, of the, of the panel report. So you don't just go and tinker with it. That is why. So we expect the governor. I mean, what does it take? If you send somebody, you just say, I am sorry. If you stole this thing, then restitution. I stole your phone, take. Or the phone is missing, this is the cost, this is the amount. Or even if I'm going to give you half of the money, I mean, something to show that I am remorseful. And that is exactly what we expect. So I don't expect the state government to do otherwise. Because if it does otherwise, it simply means there is not remorseful. And if it's not remorseful, I can tell you that it's going to trigger another one. Because 10 people are really angry. So nerves are afraid. And the governor has to be extremely careful in dealing with it. Extremely careful. So there is no point in going to... I believe in another one week or thereabout, the, the, the white paper should be out. And it's immediately after they are talking of implementation, as recommended by the panel. That is the only way that trade nerves can be calm to a very large extent. I said a very large extent because the issues that led to the NSAS protests must be addressed. If yeah, they are but, not addressed, but sadly, and you think peace will return, it's like catching the mist. Sadly, uh, Mr. Ingotari, and I'm sorry that we're, we're, we're staying with this, but there's so much of it that needs to be spoken about. Um, sadly, of course, we're still seeing... Um, you know, the same issues that led to the, the NSAS protests, we still see some of those things happen in, you know, our lives today. You know, there's still a lot of injustice, you know, concerning the police and high hand and there's still, still some levels, actually not just some, there's still a high level of police brutality, um, you know, across the country today. What we may not see is the actual special anti-robbery squad, but we still see clips of people who are armed and not dressed in any police uniform, acting as police officers. We still hear of people's houses being broken in, into, you know, um, here and there. 
And so not very much has changed. Um, and another thing is, you know, with regards to implementing, you know, the um, uh, white paper findings or the recommendations from the white paper, it would take more than just the state governor to do that, I believe. The federal government will also need to get involved. But this is a federal government that has not even admitted any wrongdoing in the first place. The Minister of Information, Lai Mohammed, has not even admitted that any life was lost in Lekki. Whereas the report says that much as 96 bodies were on record um, during the protest. So, what, what, what's the question? Yeah, so I'm asking, I mean, how, how can anything be implemented well, um, on the state and on the federal level when they haven't even been able to admit that any wrong was done? <laughs> well, I, 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 well, national telly, I don't want to use some strong words, very hard words, because uh, permit me to say, that unfortunately, Lai Mohammed is one discredited minister. A minister that is a shame to the nation, not just the government, because he's actually doing the bidding of the government. But we are not interested in what lies have said. I mean, the facts are there, like they say, no rest equal to people. It is there. The facts are there. What are you going to argue? You have an evidential proof. You know, so all we are going to urge the federal government, including the state and by extension the federal government and other states, because other states are yet to uh, 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 submit and the panels are yet to speak their findings and recommendations. What I expect the labor government and the federal government to do is simple. The panel, they set up the panel. The panel wasn't set up by individuals or CSO or uh, uh, um, uh, what have you, but by the government. And the go panel has come up with its findings and recommendations. If the Mr. President and the government of Lagos State fails to implement, then I am telling you, and you have another crisis, they are responsible for the crisis. Now, we have a government that is draconian, a government that is impervious to criticism, a government that has no respect for the rule of law. We are in a country where the rule of law is based and administration of justice round this of battle. We have a government that is completely insensitive. And so I am not surprised when the government, you know, they felt by saying that they were going to impress a lot of Nigerians and outsiders. But I ask you a simple question. If they say to you, you're a woman, does so that make you a woman? The facts are there. It was uh, Winston Churchill. Who said truth is incontrovertible? He said malice may attack it, ignorance may deride it, but there it is in the end. We also have in uh, what is it called? Uh, Allow to miss book. The gods are not to blame. The rendition of audible stress. He said the moon moves slowly, but by doing it has crossed the sky. There are things you just cannot stop. Just like the water that flows up the river into the stream, you can't stop it. Is a job of distributor. You can't stop it. So these are facts. It is clear now that lives we are lost. It is also clear now that the role of the military was unconstitutional. So what the government should do is simple: implement the recommendations of the panel it set up. It wasn't set up by anybody. And if it fails to do that, then it's going to be a prescription for anarchy because Nigerians will now realize that. The government is not there to protect lives and property. The government is there to oppress, kill, and destroy. And nobody, nobody will allow you say, when you are pushed to the wall, you bounce back with a double effort. Nobody is like, it's a stick or a tree that will stand and allow itself to be killed. People are already clamoring that Nigerians should be given the license to carry guns. And why do you have that at this point in time? Because they believe that the federal government has failed in its duty to protect life and property. So the only way you can come to this for now is to ensure that you implement it. Whether you agree with the report or not, you mo with uh, the findings or not, you must implement those findings. Because people died. We all know that people died. We all know that what life did was dispensation of falsehood, mendacy men loquence. That was all I did. Like that is Lai Mohammed. They lie, lie Mohammed. That was what he did. So Nigerians are not interested in what lies say. 
And Guarish will also understand that the boss starts at his table. If he allows all these minions, because there are minions who are trying to ingratiate themselves to him. So if he allows all these minions to destroy his uh, already damaged reputation, to destroy it further, then he takes the blame. And tomorrow nobody will say the lies government. Nobody will say CDS government. Nobody will say Jim of Muhammad Buhari. So let him realize this much. Okay. I believe, I don't know if he's even listening, I don't even know if he's going to travel out of the country tonight or tomorrow, or if he's going to live in by 12, because that's the only thing we hear. The only time Mr. President we hear about Mr. President, he's gone out of the country. He's gone to address issues in other countries where he cannot address issues in his own country. How ironic and how ridiculous. You know, so let him ensure that the findings of these panels are implemented. And the governor should do his bit. He should also go and have a meeting with Mr. President. Not, is not whenever they have political campaigns or whenever they have uh, conventions that they leave the state or when somebody is deferring for All right. one party to the Let's have you, let's have you share your thoughts on the other issue because I'm, I'm sure that this conversation uh, would never, you know, would never come to an end of this conversation. All right, so I'm thinking that we need to yeah, just move okay. away uh, because <clears throat> the conversation will always be endless uh, with this particular one. All right, so on the Daily Independent newspaper, uh, you also have a report saying four people died in another building collapse in Lagos, and that's uh, around the Badagri area of Lagos. Uh, let's share your thoughts on that. We're still grappling with the um, effect and the outcome of the collapsed building in Ikoyu, and now we have another situation. Yeah, I think I, I think the bane of the of the building industry uh, is, is factory. You have a lot of facts, and I do. You have personal bodies like uh, you have um, uh, the architects, you have the civil engineers, you have Corem, you have NSC, you have um, uh, country surveyors, and so. But I don't understand why. Uh, I think they should come up with a law making it criminal for anybody to get involved in building without having the recipe qualification. That is one. Now, it goes beyond qualification. It has also to do with the standards of materials. That is where Sun comes in. Uh, when the Koyu building collapsed, Sun went there, got samples for testing. But then, these are things that should precede the construction of that building and not proceed the construction of that building. So I think some should be alive to these responsibilities. In other words, they should have a team, a tax force, that will go around building material markets to ensure that standard material, building materials, are up for sale. And not, you know, for example, you have a mixture. If you want to make cement, you have the mixture. Everything is not by accident. It is not a matter of thinking. It is not a matter of choice. It's a question of compulsion. So what some should do is to go around building materials. And again, this government can, can, is also liable. It's also culpable. What happens is if you're influential and you're close to the government or you're close to the government, what they did, like what I heard about the Ikoi building, what a lot of people do is they get permission for a four-story building. Then by the time he gets to the fourth floor, the man makes more money. He goes to maybe Ministry of Town Planning or Urban Development or whatever. He gives them extra money and they approve for eight-story building. When the foundation is meant for four-story building. It's a, it's a portmanteau of issues. And what I expect is for the professionals to come together and address these issues. Because it's rubbing up negatively on their profession. Negatively. You cannot, even if you have been building for a hundred years, and you don't have the license. You can't come and talk of experience. You must work under somebody. Civil engineers, mechanical engineers, mechanical engineers are those who do the plumbing in buildings. People think they are just there to repair engines. No, they are actually the ones responsible for plumbing. What we call plumbing, plumbing in in, in buildings is their duty. So when you are coming, you just say give the contract to a civil engineer. The civil engineer, no, we have a team of engineers headed by the architect, because in the building industry, the architect is the head, headed by the, who does the design. 
Today, yeah. most people will just call an architect, give him money, and give, tell him to go ahead. So the architect learned from the design to foundation to the fin to finishing, which is extremely, extremely wrong. Very, very wrong. So these are all the issues affecting the building industry. And the federal this, uh, government, when I mean go, uh, sorry, I you, the government, both state and federal, should ensure, because they should also have a monitoring team, should ensure that even if it's a one-story building, that they have a tax force. And most governors are not interested in that. But it's not the case of a tax force. I mean, because you, you, you have mentioned that uh, we, we need laws and then we need professional bodies to come together because uh, they need to checkmate what's going on in the building industry or construction industry, as it were. But, but, but you, you have a case where you have government bodies, I mean, there are laws already, and then you have procedures that should be followed to the letter to ensure that uh, buildings are not just erected how people feel. But it's not about the laws you know, here. It's about people following no, no, diligently no. and obeying the laws. You know, I, I, I said it's a portmanteau. You know, I agree. This what you just said now. I also said I raised that issue. I said, for example, people will have uh, uh, approval for for a foundation for four story building, and by that they get to the fourth floor. Maybe they made more money. They go and bribe, and they tell them, go ahead. Build six, seven, eight story building. That's just trying to respond to what you, what you just said. So I said, now, no, if, for example, that happens in River State, I I use that hypothetically, that happens in River State. Of course, by the time you prosecute, the man who gave the approval, because if without the approval, the man goes beyond what is approved, then you can just go and demolish. You don't even, you demolish it. That's why I talk of student laws. Demolish the building, you don't negotiate with it. They said four floors. Now, this is the fifth floor. You demolish. You are not even negotiating with the man. This will serve as a deterrent to others. But in most cases, they go back to the ministry and bribe. Now, that man that has the, uh, that has the uh, mandate to approve, the, approv the approving authority to be prosecuted, once he, without an option of fine, because we are talking about loss of life, once that man is prosecuted, others, they say when he told him, form, force him to a pitch, others will take caution. All that man is prosecuted, even if you are giving 100 million naira, you will tell yourself, my dear, how will I enjoy this 100 million naira when I'm behind bars? And you, you will not accept that money. So that's why I say it's a portmanteau of issues, a whole lot of things. But then you must have the stringent laws, not the law of uh, you need an approval to build 20 story building, you, uh, you need an approval to. No, no, that's not that. Okay. If you get an approval for a 20 story building and you build 20 and a half, that building will be demolished, just as it is with the case of uh, kidnappers. Once they know that you're a kidnapper, they are going to demolish your building. That building will be demolished. We are not going to negotiate it. When you have a right now, you right. can't really do it because there is no law backing you. So if you have such stringent law, a lot of people are going to be cautious. A lot of people are going to get both the man with the mandate to approve and the man that is, that is building, the, that is the owner of the, 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 the structure. They are all going to, because nobody will want to build two-story building and get it demolished. Nobody will want to do that. So that's why I said, it's, it's a, and of course, you need those in the industry to drive this. Some, because most of these building materials are substandard. That's why some comes in. That's standard of the job of Nigeria. Most of these materials are substandard. I will not know. I am not an engineer, I am not an engineer, I am not a professor. I will not know. But the quantity surveyor knows. The architect might know by experience. The civil engineer might know by experience. But the quantity of the world knows because he's so trained. You see, so you need all of them. But if you are doing that in Nigeria to the work of Moses, you get an architect, you design that, you tell him to go ahead and do. Now he uses his own experience to, from foundation to the, to, to the last story. He believes he knows it all because he wants to put all the whole money in his pocket. It shouldn't be allowed. That architect whom you contacted, if you fail to get a civil engineer, you should be prosecuted. If the civil engineer fails to get an electrical engineer, he should be prosecuted. That's why the stringent laws. So when you have a collapse, you say, okay, where is the civil engineer? Where is the mechanical engineer? Where is this one? Oh, I come, see that. But again, the economy. People are trying to cut down costs. That's the truth. So where are they? See that. Where is your own approval? Where is your own approval? You, the owner of the structure, you are going in. You, the civil engineer that handled the structure from foundation to now, you are also going in. Or you, the architect, you are also going in. Tomorrow, you give an architect after designing the house, 
is going to ensure that he gets a civil engineer. All right. He's going Design, to ensure if you get a cost more, but you're going to save lives. All right, Let, let's move on to other things. Uh, also, the Punch newspapers this morning. Um, it seems Christmas might be a little more expensive than expected. It says here yeah, the federal government raises power tariff in December and begins a free meters purchase. There's also a story, I, I think you can probably just squeeze um, uh, your thoughts in on these two stories. Uh, passengers lament as railway workers begin strike and ground services. Um, we spoke with the, um, uh, a member of the, uh, uh, the DJ, I believe, of the Niger Nigeria Railway Workers uh, Association um, sometime this week, and he complained that there have not been any, there hasn't been any salary review for railway workers since 1983 or 87. Um, some of them still earn as little as 27 or 26,000 naira a month, and they will be going on a nationwide strike from um, the 18th, a three-day strike from the 18th, I believe. Um, so let's get your thoughts on these two stories. First of all, the increment in power tariff um, in December and also the railway workers strike. I think it is fast becoming, okay, there is also an increment in uh, uh, petroleum, the petroleum products. Otherwise, it is yeah, fast uh, becoming yeah. cheaper to run your gen. Also share that, yeah, yes. because it, Start becoming cheaper to run. You know, there are times I get a deal in one month for a hundred thousand naira, and I laugh. And when you go back and negotiate, you can at times negotiate to fifty thousand naira. So where did the other fifty thousand naira come from? Again, the power supply is quite epileptic. What they be? Or what? I think, was it Jonathan that uh, deregulated the, the sector? The whole essence is to ensure efficiency. Do we have it? No. They brought in this. Well, national health. I wanted to use. Sorry, I'll use it and condemn me. They brought in these four stars to head to, after the regulation to head it, and they are all there to make money. They are not interested in service delivery. They are not. What are you increasing? If you increase, you end up saying nobody should subscribe anymore because Nigerians are hungry and can barely afford even the current rate. Everything you need is provided locally. Nothing is imported. We have them here. If any of them says they are imported, they are lying, they should come and put everything is provided locally. So why will you your child be based on dollar? Why? Why will it be based on forest when everything is provided locally? Because that is the excuse they give. Which is which is reasonable, it's, it's just a strategy. So I think the federal government at this point, that's why we are saying we have a government that is quite insensitive. The federal government or the National Assembly at this point should wait. The National Assembly are not really bother because they are not the ones paying. The government is paying. They have bogus allowances for doing nothing. For doing practically nothing. They have access. Some of them can run their generators for a whole year without bothering about NEPA. Because when a man goes home with about 30 million naira or just about in a month, you, 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 I mean, you look at it. So they are not bothered. It is a common man that suffers. You pay even when this one you say, uh, pay as you go. You pay as you go. There is no like at the end of the month, before you, within two weeks, they've come. Oh, your DC is finished, your credit is finished. You know the game. These are thieves. They are just thieves. I'm very sorry to say. They are just thieves. So Nigerians will resist it. We must resist it. We must ensure that they stop feeding facts on the sufferings and sweat of Nigerians. Because in actual sense, when it comes to service delivery, they have they perform that peacefully. How many times do you have uh, PS, you call it NEPA, PSU, and how many times do you have NEPA in a day? How many times? You're running your generator. Then you have Nepal light for maybe two, three hours, four, five hours max. 
the remaining how many uh, 18 hours or there about your own generator. What of, if you're running an office, you know the cost? Even going to court here at the Babin Saloon. What of your things in your deep freezer? These are all the issues. So I want to say, or I want to call on Nigerians to resist any increment. We must resist. Because everything is provided or purchased or sourced locally. So you don't to base it on facts. It is extremely wrong. All right. um, you can also, also quickly speak on the um, uh, railway workers' strike. Uh, they are going to be grounding you know, the, the whole of the railway system for three days as a warning strike uh, to get the uh, Nigerian government to in, improve on their welfare and their remunerations. Uh, share your thoughts on that one. Once again, you know, uh, it was said when we spoke with uh, um, one of them that they earn as little as 26,000 naira a month. And there has not been any increment in their pay for more than 20, 30 years now. Well, you see, <laughs> we have a government with lips dripping its words of nullification and interposition. This is a government that talks of minimum wage of 30,000 30, 30, minimum wage. So I'm even shocked to hear that we still have federal government workers earning below 10,000. I'm sure. And it beats me that in this, our economy, biting economy, where people can barely have one square meal, feed once a day, somebody is talking of even 30,000 naira, whereas you are paying National Assembly members 30 million a month, you buy cars for them, they have uh, all kinds of allowances. But the president is traveling out every day, the vice president, the minister, oh, oh my God of his how how big dead can one be? I want them to go on that strike. I really want them to go on that strike. They must increase their salaries, and not just the salary, the condition of service. Because if you really want people, if you want people to get encouraged to work in that sector, of course, there, there are some sort of what I call allowments. There must be some sort of attraction. And whether you like it or not, it is their right. You don't keep fat on the sweat of others. It is very, very wrong. So if they want to back on a strike, first, they should not be paid the minimum wage of 30000 naira. At least 40,000 naira. At least 40,000 Because as at where we said 30,000 naira, how much was it naira to the dollar? Because if we say 30,000 naira to the tomorrow, they will also protest because of the economy that is getting worse by the day. A minimum of 40,000 naira would be condition of service. So they look at how they went and stole all those railways. They said bandits or said this. You might not really get the full details. We are talking of railway, it's a welcome development started by Jonathan, continued by this administration. They are doing very well in terms of railway. But you cannot just talk of the structure without those that are going to manage the structure. Because eventually they will also steal those things that you put in there to survive. Or there will be non challenge and you start having uh, 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 rail accidents. That's the truth. We are talking of lives as well. So I believe that the minimum wage for railway workers, in fact, all workers should be 40,000 naira, and the condition of service improved upon. If they want to embark on this strike, I ask them to embark on this strike, if they are wanting strike, and if the federal government fails to negotiate with them and anoint their prayers, then it should be an indefinite strike, and that will make nonsense of the whole railway constructions and railway projects we'll be having in this country. All right, let's um, look at the Guardian newspaper. Uh, the seem to, this seems to be a constant on the Guardian. He says uh, it's an editorial. Federalism is the answer after all. Do you think federalism is really the answer to all of the uh, issues, many issues that Nigeria is faced with at the time? Oh, yes, yes, yes. I, I have a conviction, and I'm a strong advocate of federalism. Some say fiscal federalism, and excuse me, I just laugh because there is no such thing as fiscal federalism. You say that is federalism or it's not federalism. 
Because when you talk about federalism, it involves fiscal federalism. That's the truth about it. Here you have uh, the federal unions are quite autonomous, and most importantly, you have the centrifugal system of government that against the central federal system of government. In other words, you're devolving. We have about 62, 63, 64 items on the exclusive list. It is extremely wrong. That is antithetical to federalism, to any federal country anywhere in the world. Now, why we talk of federalism is simple, but let me, let me address that first before we go into it. Because even when we have true federalism, when we have federalism, it's not true. When we have federalism, even the state governments are going to abuse it because even the local government <laughs> are suffering exactly, or even worse than what the state governments are suffering in the hands of the federal government. Now, when you talk of federalism, for example, now, it also entails the separation of powers. It's a whole gamut. It entails also the separation of powers. But you have where you're going to have every state will just pay tax to the center. This was what gave rise to the VAT issue. Every state will pay tax to the center. Now, that tax you pay to the center is to ensure the maintenance of security at the national level. But the states have their police. So they know how to police their state. You know how to police your house more than any other person. It is going to be abused initially. But with the passage of time, things are going to be correct. Now, every state will not have its police. Every state will have its judiciary. Every state, like in America, you have the Supreme Court of the States. Then you have the National Supreme Court. So all you basically do is you don't need to go cap in hand like you guys say FAC, like you have the FAC now, the, the federal government is busting money to states and is busting money to local governments. No. The reverse is going to be the case where you pay tax to the center. You are going to develop a very good example of, of what, then it wasn't federalism, but the parliamentary center of government, but it could give you an insight, was when we had the parliamentary system of government, we had the regions. We are basically in control. The Italians are basically in control of their business. And we saw healthy competition that went on. That was when we had, if that was when we had, uh, uh, what, Isoka, and we had the radio station, we had the TV, we had all kinds of healthy competition that went on. Until Gowan came and changed the job because he wanted to remain in power. Excuse me, dismantled the, uh, the, uh, the journalism and went into state creation, just to weaken, to vitiate the powers of the government. So we need a federal system of government. And once we have a federal system of government, a lot of people, the center will be less attractive. We are going to have people struggling to become governors of their various states. Of course, one or two want to be, because you cannot underestimate or <laughs> dismiss the powers of a president of any nation. But it will be less attractive. Where you have a federal system of government, because it also, they're talking of the local governments. The state governors, too, will have less influence on who becomes a local government chairman. It's going to be a local. And the money is meant for local government, will be given to local government. So the chairmen uh, are going to be uh, responsible to the people and not look up to the government of the state. Like it is the case right now. If you go and travel abroad, you'll agree with me that most people know their mayors. They might not even know who their governor is, but they know their mayors. And the mayors are responsible for certain things. So there will be development in that local government because the state governor will have no power to dictate to the local government chairman what to do. And if the local government chairman is derelict in his duties, the people will know how to hold him accountable. You don't force people on anybody. That is where the, even the issue of the direct primary is coming. That's why people advocated for the direct primary. So, if we talk of federalism, yes, let us practice federalism. I agree with that. It's a very hard question. If, if we talk of federalism, now, for example, you have the IPOP issue, we won't have taken this dimension. It's not about doing this dimension. But the people believe that in a country called Nigeria, they have been marginalized. But in the federal state, they would not feel that way. They would not feel that way. So, I want federalism. And we have to practice federalism. We said Federal Republic of Nigeria. Let us practice federalism. And I believe that once we practice federalism to a very large extent, we are going to address most of these nagging issues. And we are going to have a semblance of peace in the country.
I think we can um, wrap up the conversation here. It was an extended um, um, version of, uh, of the press, but uh, of course we thank you, Upunabo Inkotaria, uh, for spending time with us and for sharing your thoughts on these stories uh, this morning. Thank you so much. Uh, Many thanks for joining. For joining. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. All right, uh, we'll take a short break. Uh, of course, uh, Today in History comes up next before we move into our first major conversation. Stay with us.